One of the ongoing debates among ethics scholars revolves around the question of whether ethical reasoning depends upon a system of principles. This question stems from one still more fundamental. Is our ethical behavior contingent upon our being fully aware of what's right and wrong? Or, as some philosophers wonder, are we quite capable of figuring out ethics without relying on any principles whatsoever? Is our moral sense innate, even hardwired into us the way language is? Evolutionary psychologists go so far as to assert that our moral compass was not a later invention of our intellect, but rather developed over time in our brains simultaneously with many of our other biological survival mechanisms. The study of ethical thought, especially in the classical Western tradition, has of course placed the intellect clearly at the center of moral judgment. By contrast, however, the study of ethics over the last century has drawn substantial inspiration from the social sciences. The result has been a more nuanced attitude by scholars with regard to the source of our ethical behavior. The relatively recent field of moral psychology asserts that although we are equipped to work things out intellectually, our struggles with moral dilemmas and other ethical problems are more often than not guided by our emotional responses, deeply seated in the primitive recesses of our brain and largely out of reach of the steadying hand of our more modern tempering intellect. Nevertheless, Others would argue that people could not function at all cohesively in their respective groups, societies, nations, etc., <coughs> without a set of moral ideals to guide them. Many who advocate this position point to the moral precepts or ethical codes intrinsic to religion, for example. However, atheists are quick to point out that one can make morally sound judgments and act ethically without recourse to any religious doctrine. Ethics also tends to be one of those terms that we throw, throw around without really possessing a full understanding and appreciation of the term. Are we speaking of meta-ethical principles? Not ethical principles in their own right, but rather the study of the nature of ethics that tends to focus on large concept, larger concepts of good, right, justice, and fairness, and attempts also to identify moral values. Or are we referring to normative ethics? which endeavors to develop general theories, rules, and principles of moral conduct and have us apply them to everyday situations. In both cases, what do we mean by principles? Although ethics ostensibly relies on empirical processes and logical reasoning, its principles tend to mostly depend on the understanding and application of norms. Normative theory sometimes defies logical problem solving. What we ought to do, the so-called normative principles underlying ethics, is seldom evaluated on the logical consistency of those principles. Then why should we adhere to a normative principle in the first place? Immanuel Kant, for example, believed we have an obligation to do what is right without reliance upon moral agency or concern for the consequences of our actions. The efficacy of this deontological or duty-based approach to moral reasoning is measured not by the results it produces, but rather by how well it conforms to the implicit nature of identifiable moral principles that surface from our reasoning about those principles. Kant rationalizes the implicitness of moral principles by observing whether any one principle can be justified by its universality and consistency. This categorical imperative is the capacity of a principle to give rise to universally consistent outcomes. Of course, such justification always implies its inverse. Certain principles, when put to the test, will generate universally inconsistent results. Yet merely to ignore the consequences of moral action is perhaps the most serious flaw in Kantian thought. Deontological principles, as a rule, ignore the deliberative dimensions of ethical problem solving. Within a utilitarian or even a consequentialist framework, an ethical principle could not be justifiable by its universality, but by whether behaviors associated with that principle foster morally satisfactory outcomes. In the case of the utilitarian, whether the outcomes serve the greater good, and in the case of the consequentialist, 
whether happiness and well-being can be restored to those outside the greatest number whom the greatest good has passed over. As such, an ethical principle cannot be applied consistently to every situation within all conceivable contexts. Thus defying, excuse me, thus violating the two defining conditions of the categorical imperative. Because situations and contexts vary widely, and can be argued an ethical principle at best can only serve as a sort of normative guideline. However, just because ethical principles will often resemble guidelines, we should not construe them as simple rules possessing little intelligent depth. Of course, some ethical codes, such as those used in certain professions, often present themselves as recommendations, vacant of any substantial moral force. Further, while certain ethical principles may often appear commandment-like, many behave more like parables or stories containing moral lessons. It should come as no surprise, therefore, that in a number of professions and in the college classroom, training programs and courses in ethics, respectively, rely heavily on case studies as the principal pedagogical tool in order to instill ethical principles in practitioners and students alike. According to public relations ethicist Emanuel Chavigian, stories play a powerful role in our sense of right and wrong. Chavigian observes, we may have forgotten exactly what it is we should or shouldn't do, but we always remember the stories used as examples and illustrations. Neil Postman notes that behind the apparent simplicity of parables, there are some profound ideas to ponder. He explains, among the most subtle and important is the notion of where and how problems originate. This notion is crucial to the idea of ethos, the way we formulate coherent assumptions and beliefs that help us to apprehend our moral nature and reinforce our personal and communal values. <clears throat> so, in what way can general semantics assist us with our ethical sense-making and lead us toward alternatives to conventional Aristotelian meta-ethical views and Kantian normative precepts? Korzybski argues that it is futile to preach morals of any metaphysical kind. He goes on to assert that these are delusional dogmas profoundly semantically harmful. Philosophies of various kinds, Korzybski states, display infantile characteristics. It goes without saying that Korzybski saw Aristotelian philosophy as suspect, representing an extreme delusional tendency and dismissing it as gross empiricism, elemental and structurally fallacious. Further, the fallacy of universality, according to Korzybski, is that it inherently involves the semantic one-value conviction of validity for all time to come. The tradition of moral reasoning has been to perpetuate concepts of right and wrong in the expectation that such concepts will help to promote human happiness and well-being, what Aristotle in his work, The Nicomachean Ethics, calls flourishing. The Aristotelian promise of a life of human flourishing requires us to conduct ourselves in a praiseworthy manner and to follow social norms, acting in accordance with what prudence dictates and reflecting on what a morally right course of action ought to be. What if we could divorce ourselves from conventional Aristotelian notions of good? What sort of ethical guidance could general semantics supply instead? General semantics, as its proponents and interpreters have contended, can serve a pragmatic rather than a classically normative role in identifying ethical problems and proposing methods to solve these problems. Pragmatic methods, rather than normative principles, might better help us with ethical sense-making, in other words, the process of elaborating and defending our moral reasoning. General semantics, for example, recognizes the limitations language imposes on our apprehension of the world. Thus, age-old philosophical concepts of virtue, morality, and the, and the good can often seem fluid and vague. General semantics argues for clarity in thinking about these concepts. Ethical problem solving at its core appears to be a way we try to make sense of our environment, our actions, and the behavior of others. We are in one way or another, and to varying degrees, directly and indirectly affected by our environment, our own actions, and the actions, and the behavior of other people. The manner, therefore, in which we attempt to make sense of moral problems tends to be related to how intensely we are affected by our environment, our own actions, and the behavior of others. In other words, our motivation to resolve an ethical problem 
tends to be gauged by our expectation of the personal or communal consequences of that problem. If we were to pay attention to our moral reasoning, to be mindful of our ethical decision making, we would see that it is often pragmatic. We attempt to make the best of situations while trying to minimize the negative outcomes. When things appear to be going well, we rarely seek to alter our environment, our own actions, and the actions of others. However, when we encounter stumbling blocks, impeding the attainment of our goals, we might look for ways to alter our environment, our actions, and the behavior of others, or maybe not. Pragmatically speaking, such impediments can be functional, dealing with particular practical matters, systemic, related to the whole interrelation of environment and behavior, or dynamic, connected to changes in either or both environment and behavior. Aristotle conjectures that the goal of a fulfilling life is some sort of good. However, the Aristotelian presumption is that all activities converge on the good. As a practical matter, though, some of what we do seems to be behavior for its own sake, such as getting by or just getting on with life. Ethical reasoning is thus better conceived as fundamentally pragmatic. Ethics essentially is based on the belief that certain behaviors will lead to more efficacious outcomes than others. We favor or prescribe particular behaviors and disparage or proscribe other behaviors. Thus, the practical nature of ethics precedes the normative, not the other way around. Yet ethics most often emerges as inherently norm normative because that is generally the way we talk about ethics in a rationalized, post hoc manner. Ideally, reasoning about outcomes of our behavior should prompt us to govern and regulate ourselves. In general, children integrate social and moral norms that guide them toward right conduct and deter them from troublesome conduct. As Albert Bandura explains, the sanctions of children apply to themselves keep conduct in line, excuse me, the sanctions children apply to themselves keep conduct in line with in internal standards. However, such self-regulation, to use Bandura's term, or what Martin Levinson refers to as self-management, especially as our patterns of thinking solidify as we grow older, can become selectively disengaged from our behavior. Reconstructing negative conduct as serving worthy purposes can, in Bandura's analysis, obscure personal agency by diffusion or displacement of responsibility. Moreover, such alterations to our thinking can minimize appreciation of the negative consequences of our actions and cause us, cause us to shift blame away from ourselves and onto those we have injured. We have only to look at the headlines pouring from the White House to gain a sense of this kind of aberrant behavior and its implications for personal and communal sanity. Yet ethics is not always or totally pragmatic. It is not entirely focused on identifying the best means to achieve an end. Moral reasoning can also be considered teleological, permitting us to abstract into the future, to envision an end we wish to pursue, and perhaps most importantly, to contemplate what will be the right thing to do. Ethical problem solving, therefore, can be viewed as a sign of both personal and communal moral progress, in which we direct more of our activity toward the realization of the greater good and less toward ineffective or even harmful outcomes. However, we cannot regard all solutions issuing from our ethical problem solving as improvements. Progress and regress both are possible outcomes of human activity. Progress typically is characterized by time binding, the discovery of practical moral behavior, refining that behavior over subsequent generations, and giving rise to persistently successful moral activity. Effective ethical problem solving builds upon accumulated knowledge and sustaining morally tenable outcomes based on earlier attempts to coalesce and apply that knowledge. And I'll conclude with some citations from Korzybski, who writes, a modern revision of the Aristotelian system or the building of a non-Aristotelian system involved or is based on similar aims, namely the formulation of a general method, not only for scientific work, but also for life. By life, we can infer that Korzybski means a host of things, including possibly ethical problem solving. Ethical dilemmas have for millennia been our constant companion. The way we reason morally, of course, has evolved too during that time. Korzybski observes, 
The aim of the work of Aristotle and the work of the non-Aristotelians is similar, except for the date of our human development and the advance of science. He concludes, in general semantics, in building up, building up a non-Aristotelian system, the aims of Aristotle are preserved, yet scientific methods are brought up to date. Thank you. Thank you.